looked to see and we talked about what does it mean to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. And today we're going to continue on to looking at equip. And what does it mean to be equipped for ministry? And we're going to be looking at the life of Christ. And we're going to be looking at what, how did Jesus make disciples. But before we jump in, would you just join with me and let's just open a word of prayer. Okay, let's just pray and just ask God to speak to us this morning. Father, I come before you and I thank you so much for the privilege that you've given us to be here this morning. I'm asking you, Father, this morning that your spirit would speak to our hearts, that you would just teach us from your word this morning, that we would just uh, understand clearly what it means to be a disciple of Christ, and that it'd be something that we wouldn't just have an intellectual knowledge about, but that it would transform the way we live our lives on a daily basis. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now to start with that, I want to start with this telling telling you a simple story of my own personal life. Many, many years ago, I was probably about 20 years old, 21 years old. A friend of mine came to me and said, hey, Curtis, I want to hire you to come and work construction for me. And, and I'm, I'm going to teach you how to build houses. And I was all excited. Now I'm 20, 21 years old. That'll be cool. Go out. You know, I lived in California at the time. And I remember showing up on the job and he, he told me, okay, here's your job today. Um, I want you to cut blocks. And I'm like, okay, I can cut blocks. So he taught me how to use a saw. And I didn't know anything about carpentry. I was just like a greenhorn. I had no clue what I was doing. You know, I knew the tape measure had inches on it and, and had, you know, half an inch, three quarters of an inch. You know, I was learning from the very, very beginning. He showed me how to make a little crow's foot to make a, lot, a straight line and how to mark everything. And I remember I started um, learning how to just simply cut blocks. And so... That day, if you'd have showed up onto the construction site and asked me, Curtis, what are you doing? I'd have said, well, I'm cutting blocks. You know, this is pretty exciting. I'm really moving up in the world. You know, I'm cutting blocks. And so I, I learned how to cut blocks. And then he showed me how to do other things. And little by little, he started teaching me how to do different little odds and ends in construction. And I felt like I was doing really good. But there was one problem. If you'd have come to the job site each day and asked me what I was doing... I would tell you I'm cutting blocks, or I'm doing this. Because something that this contractor failed to do with me, or for me, was he never gave me the big picture. He never gave me the big picture. So he would tell me, for example, Curtis, today I need you to cu cut me five or eight uh, two-by-fours, 36 inches long. And I want you to nail them in all the corners. And so I would just say, okay. So if you came to the job that day, say, well, I'm cutting uh, two-by-fours, 36 inches long, and I'm nailing them all the corners. But I did not know why I was doing what I was doing. Again, I didn't have the big picture. So if you just showed up to, to my job that day, I would have told you, I'm cutting 36 inches, two by, 36 inch long two-by-fours. That would have been my job for the day. But little by little, as I continued to work construction and build houses after, you know, maybe the second, third house... I started getting the big picture, and I started realizing those blocks that I was cutting, I was cutting for a reason. I was cutting blocks and nailing them in between the two-by-fours because they were called fire blocks, and they were for fire blocks. They were to, to keep fire from coming up the wall if there were ever a fire inside the wall. The reason why I was cutting those other two-by-fours was for I would have, so I'd have backing for the sheetrock on the corners of the building. So little by little, as I started understanding why I was doing what I was doing, construction became more interesting and more exciting for me. Because I started seeing the big picture. And you know what? I think a lot of times our Christian life is the same way. A lot of times we see this small little picture. And something that I think that Jesus did with his disciples is he didn't just give them this small picture of where he wanted to take them, he gave them the big picture. And as I got the big picture of what I was doing and building a house, guess what happened? I started taking more ownership. Because if you had come to my job site late, a year or two years later, you'd ask me, what are you doing today? Oh, we're building this 3,000 square foot home. You know, yeah, I might be cutting blocks at that moment, but I'm building a house. And so that is what Jesus did. And so today, what I want to do today, and what we want to do these next three weeks, is we want to give you a vision. We want to give you a picture of what it means to encounter, equip, and engage our lives with Christ. We want to give you a picture of what that means so that when you 
come to Coastal Life and you're part of this Coastal Life family, you go, you know what? I know what that means. I own it and I believe it. So we're going to start by looking at John chapter 17. And I'd like to ask you to join with me as we read John 17 verses 1 through 4. It says, After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. I have brought you glory here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Two things we learn from Jesus here. Number one, Jesus' is, Jesus' heart was to bring glory to the Father. I brought you glory. And how did Jesus bring glory to the Father? By completing the work that God had called him to do. Now, what is that work? And maybe some of you have heard me share this before, but what is that work that he's talking about? Because we see that Jesus has not gone to the cross yet. And we normally look at Jesus' work as going to the cross and dying for our sins. And that is the ultimate work and mission of Jesus Christ. But we see something else here. If we continue on, which we're not going to do, we see that Jesus starts praying for his disciples. And I believe that what Jesus is saying is, Father, I brought you glory while I was here on earth by completing the work of making disciples. I completed the work of making disciples. And then he goes on to pray for his disciples. And what we see is that if we go to Matthew chapter 28, if we go to Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19 and 20, we see at the very end after Jesus dies, he is resurrected, he meets his disciples again, he goes to them and he tells them, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. See, these disciples had spent three and a half years with Jesus. Three and a half years of their life were spent with Jesus. And Jesus, in those three and a half years, He showed them what it looked like to live out the life of a disciple. He showed them what it meant and looked like to be a disciple of Christ. And at the end of it all, He says, Now, I want you to do the same thing. Now, the command there is to make disciples. The way that they go about making disciples is by going, by baptizing, and by teaching. Three different things. Now it's interesting because when we think of baptizing, what's the first thing we think of? We think of what's going to happen in Stewart Beach, right? But that word baptize actually means several things. It also it means to immerse, to be immersed into, or it means to identify with, or it actually means also to over, be overcome with. So when Jesus said, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I've actually heard the argument that actually it, it might not even be talking about, quote, dunking in water. It could actually be also just mean, be, it could mean being immersed and identified with Christ in a relationship with Christ. And so when we are baptized physically in water, it's an identification. It's publicly a, a, a announcing, I'm identifying myself with Christ. I am immersing myself in Christ and with Christ, and I want you all to know that. And so here, when Jesus is telling his disciples to baptize, identifying people with Christ, we see that Jesus had done this with his disciples. And I want to show you quickly, uh, on, just on the, on the screen here, what that looks like. What does a, prof a profile of a disciple look like? Number one, a disciple is a learner or an imitator. Jesus called his disciples to follow him, and as they followed Jesus, they were learning from him. They were imitating him and learning what he was doing and taking on his character, taking on who he was. And a disciple is best described not in terms of what they do, but in terms of a relationship with Christ. And a lot of times we think of a disciple as somebody who does all these things for God. But that's not what it is. It's based on the terms of our relationship with Christ. If you have Jesus Christ in your life, you are a disciple of Christ. In John 8, 31, Jesus tells, um, he's speaking and he tells people that 
the way that we know people are disciples is by their obedience. If you are my disciple, if you're my follower, then you're going to obey me. In John 13, he tells his disciples, the world will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. So the question that I want to ask this morning and answer is, what does that look like? What does a profile of a disciple of Christ look like? And so this is where I want you to pull out your 4 by 6 card. And I'm going to invite you to just follow along on this little chart that we're going to look at this morning. And what we're going to look at this morning is we're going to go around and look and see what exactly does a profile of Christ really look like? How do I live out my life as a disciple of Christ? Because ultimately, ultimately, that is what Jesus Christ came to do. He came to equip these men to be disciples. And I travel all over, as you know, I tra- I've shared this before, I travel throughout Central and South America, I do youth ministry training, I do a lot of consulting and mentoring youth pastors and, and, and churches about youth ministry, and I have met so many people who say, you know what, Curtis, we're about making disciples, we want to make disciples, and so my next question for them is, what does that look like? Well, it means this, 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 but you know what the struggle is a lot of times, is we don't always know what does the end result look like, but Jesus paints a picture for us. He shows us through the Gospels what a profile of a disciple looks like, and it's something that each one of us is called to live out. So we're going to start by looking here on the right side where it says reaching within, and we're going to work around. And turn with me real quick to Colossians, Colossians 2. We are going to kind of move around a little bit in Scripture. Normally, we don't go this much, uh, bounce around this much in Scripture, but today we're going to. But in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, look what Paul says. He says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, Strengthen the faith, yes, you were, uh, the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. So he's telling us, continue to live in Christ and be rooted and built up in Him. And so the idea of reaching within is, like we said earlier, a disciple of Christ is not what they do, but it's about what's inside. It's about that relationship with Christ. And it starts from within. And so that's why we say reaching within. Just as Christ, we're built in Christ, and He calls us to be rooted in Christ, it's taking our roots deep in Christ, first and foremost. Now, look at John chapter 15 for a second. In John chapter 15, this is getting towards the end of Jesus' life here on earth, before He leaves His disciples. And Jesus starts giving them all kinds of words of wisdom, and giving them all kinds of of teaching just to prepare them. And look what he says in John chapter 15. And we're going to look at verses 5 through 8. He says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So the first thing we see with reaching within is Jesus is saying, it starts by having an abiding walk with Christ. It starts by abiding in Christ. It's about when we abide in Christ, when we remain in Christ, and we find our source of life in Christ, that is when we bear fruit. When we're connected to the vine, and we find our source of life in Christ, we naturally bear fruit. And what does it say here in verse 8? This is to whose glory? The church's glory? To my glory? The Father's glory. Again, we see that word glory. Christ's heart is that the Father be glorified. It's to the Father's glory that we be disciples that bear fruit, that bear much fruit. You know, 
abiding in Christ and bearing fruit. Um, I want to get away from this idea that it's about doing things for God. Because I think a lot of times that's where we identify a disciple. Man, I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm busy over here in this Bible study and I'm doing this over here and I come to church every week and I'm, I'm passing out the bulletins and those are all great things. But it starts somewhere else. It starts deeper than that. It starts where we come to the point in our life where we go, my source of life is coming from Christ. And how do we do this? How do we d develop this on a regular basis? We start it on a regular basis by having an encounter with Christ. By having an encounter with Christ. And you see the center of that circle? It says Christ. And it starts there. It's not by what we do, but it's about recognizing who Jesus Christ is and placing our faith in Him. And a lot of times what we do is we try to start this abiding walk with Christ without really knowing Christ. And I want to show you something in John chapter 6. I know we're going backwards here, but I'm trying to hopefully make a point. Go to John chapter 6. And look in John chapter 6, starting in verse 66. Now, John chapter 6 is just packed with all kinds of amazing stories. We see in, this, in, in John chapter 6, Jesus had just fed the 5,000. His disciples had an incredible experience doing this with him. Then they go across the other side of the lake, and people are looking for Jesus, and they follow him around to the other side. They find Jesus, and they go, Jesus, here you are. And Jesus looks at them. You know, it's funny because Jesus never really beats around the bush. He goes straight to the point. And he says, you know what? You guys are looking for me and you're following me because of the fact that you ate. You guys came for the free pizza. You had the free pizza, the free barbecue, whatever it is. You came for the free barbecue and that's why you're here. And then from there, Jesus goes on and we don't have time. But if we had time, I'd encourage you to read John chapter 6. From that point on, Jesus goes on and he just lets them have it. He starts challenging them. And he basically tells them, it's not through the law, it's not through Abraham. He says, I am the bread of life. If you want to have a relationship with the Father, it's through me. That's a bold statement for Jesus to make. And he offends a whole boatload of these people at this point because of the truth. But listen to what happens starting in verse 66. In verse 66 it says, from this time... Many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Interesting. He had a lot of people following him, but at this time, many of them just stopped. They go, whoa, 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 wait. This teaching's way too hard. He's, he's saying something, this is way too difficult. And at that point, many of these people that were following him for the wrong motives stopped and walked away. What's interesting, though, is he calls them disciples. Because they were following him. They were imitating him. They were learning from him. But at that point, they could no longer continue. And they stopped. Because it was too difficult. What he was teaching, maybe they couldn't accept. Maybe what he was asking them to do and be was something they could not let go of their past religion or traditional religion religion, uh, religious mindset or, or philosophy or beliefs. But then look what Jesus does next in verse 67. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. I love Simon Peter's answer. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. I love that. Lord, to whom shall we go? We believe and know. Not just we believe, but we believe and we know without a shadow of a doubt that you are the Holy One, the Son of God. Now, we just came out of doing a, a, a series called Revive. And we we're looking at all these different people throughout the, the New Testament who had an encounter with God. And we looked at the blind man in John chapter 9. And remember where he recognized he was blind and he could see, and he met Jesus, and he, he goes, I want to believe, who is this Jesus? 
I want to believe so I can, let me see him so I can believe. And Jesus said, I'm he. And remember the blind man knelt down and, and just told him, Jesus, you're my Lord. Then remember um, Nicodemus. Nicodemus, he came to the point of recognizing that Jesus is Lord. And we see at the end of Jesus' life that Nicodemus went to help bury Jesus. We see this with the centurion man. The centurion, when crucifying Christ, he recognized that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And he knelt down publicly and said, surely this man was the Son of God. We see it with many, many different stories. And here we see it with Peter and the disciples. Where they recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord, the living Son of God, who has the words of eternal life. And that's where it begins. That's where it begins for each one of us. When we can come to the point in our life, and this happened to me when I was 17 years old, where I came to the point in my life where I understood, Jesus, you are Lord, you have the words of eternal life, and I am going to own my faith in Christ and make it mine. It's not my pastors, it's not my parents, it's not my youth pastors, it's not my friends, it's mine. And that's what we see happening here with these people, with Peter, with the blind man. With Nicodemus, the centurion, Zacchaeus. They all had an encounter with Christ, but guess what? It didn't stop there. It continued. And so when we talk about having an encounter with Christ as a coastal life family, we're not talking about this experience where you had this one-time encounter with Christ and it was emotional and exciting and you had the warm fuzzies and oh, praise Jesus, you know. And we're not talking about that. We're talking about a daily encounter with Jesus Christ. Every day we are having an encounter with Jesus Christ. And when I look at the stories of the Bible, and I look at so many men and women that God touched, we see that their life with Christ didn't just start at one moment where they had this encounter and then stop there. It continued. And it continued to transform their life. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he talks about being a disciple of Christ. And so, in order for us to live out that encounter with Christ on a daily basis, the first thing we have to do is we have to have an abiding relationship with Christ. We have to have that. And the question that, might be, that you're asking is, how do I have that? So turn with me to 2 Timothy for a second. Because we're going to answer that question right now. 2 Timothy 3. This is what I love about, this, about the Bible. The Bible has the answers. God's Word has the answers. Look at what it says in 2 Timothy 3. And I believe with all my heart that this is how we continue that abiding walk with Christ on a daily basis. Verses 16 through 17 in 2 Timothy 3 says this. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. How do we continue an abiding relationship with Christ? How do we encounter Christ on a daily basis? Through the Word of God. Through the Word of God. The Word of God is useful for teaching, for correcting, for rebuking, for guiding my life, for, for teaching me how to follow. And it's through the Word of God. So that every man of God, woman of God, will be equipped to live their lives with meaning and purpose in a relationship with God. That is what he's saying. Now, now is my opportunity to make a plug for something I'm very passionate about. Okay, you guys ready for this? In the very back, there's a sign up. And we started doing this last year. Uh, we had 40 people sign up for our read-throughs. And out of those 40 people... I will go with just the small group leaders who shared with me. All the facilitators of these read-through groups said, Curtis, I have done Bible studies. I've been in church. I've done all kinds of things. But the read-through that we did, we did it for six weeks, it really had an impact in my life. And the people who participated said the same thing. So what is a read-through? Basically, what a read-through is, is you get together with four or five people, men with men, women with women. We read a chapter a day. Right now, starting, we're starting October 13th. And we're going to be starting in 1 Timothy. And uh, 1 Timothy and, then, and also Philemon. And what we'll do is you'll read a chapter a day. You will highlight one key verse that really speaks to you. 
Maybe a verse that you read that, that, uh, that's really stuck out to you, highlight that key verse, you read a chapter each day, and then sometime the next week you'll get together with your small group. Last year, my group, we met at Starbucks every day. I'm a coffeeholic. And every night, about 8 o'clock at night, once a week, we'd meet at Starbucks. And we'd just all get together and we'd go around and share what we read. Now, this was not a theology class. It was not a time of instructing. It was not about, let me just teach you. Oh, no, I don't agree. What you said there, Kevin, that was wrong. This is how it should be. No, it wasn't an argument. It was just, you know what? Everyone shares what they read. And we just have a time of going around and sharing and, and expressing what the Holy Spirit has spoken to you about through your reading time. And you know what? It is awesome. But this is a place to start. This is a great place to start that abiding relationship with God on a daily basis. If you are interested in doing this, back in the back, we are starting our sign-ups today. We'd ask you to sign up. If you know somebody you want to recruit, go recruit them. And starting October 13th, we're going to officially launch our read-throughs. And, and uh, we'll be getting going and, and continuing them all. For, our first session will be 10 weeks. So there's a starting point and there's an end date. And we'll go for 10 weeks, stop, take a break, and then we'll start back up again after the new year and continue on. This is relational. It's not a program, but it's focused and, and directed toward helping us abide in Christ through getting into the Word. So I'd encourage you afterwards, I'll be back in the back. would love to answer any more questions. So what happens? As we have an abiding relationship with Christ, as we're reaching within... What happens is it affects our character. It affects our character. Why? Because a lot of times we think of the idea of, of, of living out my Christian life, it starts by behaving. If I behave like a Christian, I'll be okay. But no, it starts from within. And as the fruits of the Spirit, as I am bearing fruit from abiding in Christ, it starts being reflected in my character, in the way I live my life, in the way I carry myself. And then all of a sudden, people start looking at people, your life and just going, this guy's different. There's something about this person. I see it in their character. I see it in the way they live their life. And guess what happens? We naturally become salt and light. And in Matthew 5, 13 and 14, Jesus told his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And he tells, tells them this after he had gone through the Beatitudes. And then he reminds them, this is who you are. And when people see our character, and they see that we are salt and light, we become salt and light naturally. That salt is something that causes people to have a thirst for Christ. And they start thirsting and, and wanting Christ in their life, and they start asking questions. And it happens naturally because of our character. And what happens is, as God is transforming our lives, we naturally start having and experiencing transformation around us. And I've seen this in my own personal life. Now what I'm sharing with you guys right now, this is not just some secret ingredient I pulled off the website. This is something that I live out in my daily life. It's my own personal way of living out my life as a disciple of Christ. As I continue being salt and light, something naturally happens. As people start asking questions, as people start looking at my life and seeing something different, I start naturally reaching out to others. It naturally happens. I start reaching out to others. I was at a volleyball tournament yesterday, and I was talking with some people, and they were asking me about what I do and, and something, and I naturally from there had an opportunity to share about what I do and about my faith in Christ. God gives us opportunities all over in our workplace. Going, going plain. Yesterday I was surfing with my son. I had this surfboard that a friend let me borrow. It had something on the back of it. And they asked me, what does that mean? Right at that moment, I had a chance to share about my relationship with Christ on the beach with two college students. So when we abide in Christ and we start affecting our character, um, we naturally become salt and light in just the way we live our lives. You don't have to go to seminary to do that. You don't have to have a theology degree it's about what God has done in your heart. What He has done in your life. And that salt and light, as it starts drawing people to Christ through your character, and we naturally start reaching out, something else happens. We become fishers of men. I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 1 for a second. I told you we're going to bounce around a lot here, so I apologize for that. But bounce over to Mark chapter 1. 
And I call Mark, the book of Mark is like the action book of the Gospels. I mean, it just starts with action and ends with action. It's kind of a great action movie. Just constantly something happening. But in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, we see Jesus do something. It says this, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Now, what I love about this is we have to understand something here. Jesus, when Jesus invited the disciples to do this, to follow him, and he was going to make them fishers of men, it happened over a period of time, and Jesus already had a relationship with them. He already knew the disciples. And at this point, he's saying, now I want you to follow me, and I am going to make you fishers of men. And so, in other words, what he's saying is, as you follow me, the result of following me is I'm going to make you fishers of men. And that's what we see here in the profile of the disciple. Following Jesus is about abiding in Christ. It's about letting him change and transform me from the inside out, which affects my character, which makes me salt and light. Now I'm ready to be fishers of men. Now let me ask you a question. Looking at this graph up here, what would happen if we took somebody straight from putting their faith in Christ and said, now I want you to go be fishers of men? Would they be ready for it? No, they wouldn't, would they? We'd be setting them up to fail. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that he couldn't, two weeks after he met his disciples, if he just said, all right, guys, guess what? It's time. Go be fishers of men. They would have looked at him like, uh, excuse me? You know, they wouldn't have gotten it. But it was because Jesus said, follow me. And the result of following me is I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And you know what? I've met a lot of people that have grown up in church. And after a while, they get frustrated. And they say, you know what? This isn't working for me. I'm just not able to do this. You know, this whole church thing, man, I'm just like, I, I blow it all the time. I, I can't perform. You know, this being a fisher of men thing, what the world does that mean? And I believe a lot of times people even leave the church because they are so frustrated and confused with they don't understand that it's about a process of following Christ. It's about a process of being equipped and trained and developed. And that's what we see Jesus Christ doing intentionally for three and a half years with his disciples. And towards the middle of this time, when he starts equipping them, he starts equipping them to become fishers of men. Now, I think for the disciples, they could relate to this. They were fishermen. And so they could relate to fishing for men. And, and so they took that and they owned that and they said, yeah, we can do this. And they understood that. But what does that look like for, for us today? To be a fisher of men. What does that look like? For me, in my personal life, as I've already been sharing, it obviously has started with abiding in Christ, letting Him affect my character, becoming salt and light, having a heart to reach out because of what Christ has done inside of me, now as I become a fisher of men, number one thing is this. If you're actually taking notes and writing this down, in that section where it says become fishers of men, I want you to write the word pray. Pray. Something I do is I pray for people. I pray specifically for people to come to know Christ. I've been praying for my neighbors, and one of my neighbors came to Christ. Whoa! What a surprise! You know? But what I have found is this. When I pray for people, specifically... It reminds me to share my faith with them. So I'd challenge you. Think of some people that you really care about that don't know Christ and say, you know what, I'm going to start praying for them. I'm going to start praying that they will come to know Christ and have a relationship with Christ. Number two is look for opportunities. Look for opportunities. Look for opportunities where you can serve people, where you can serve others who have needs. Remember, let's don't look at the small picture. Let's look at the big picture. How can I have an impact on someone else's life? 
It might start right here at Coastal Life. It might start by working with children in the children's ministry. It might be like volunteering and discipling students and working in the youth ministry. It might be by just simply helping make coffee in the morning or standing out here and greeting people or whatever else it might be. But it starts by you serving people around you. It might be by going to the House of Hope and serving there or going somewhere in our community and doing something to have an impact in people's lives. And we start living our lives around people and they start seeing the difference. Now what happened next? As the disciples started reaching out, they started developing skills. And this is something that I, I, I love because people will go, sometimes will say, man, Curtis, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. And so Jesus, with his disciples, he gave them skills. Let me show you an example. Turn with me to Luke chapter 8 for a second. Luke chapter 8. Remember, it didn't happen overnight for the disciples. It was a process. And we see that when Jesus said, follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men, there was a process that took place. And we see this process starting to take place as Jesus is equipping his disciples in Luke chapter 8. Look at it, it says in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So what happens here is we see Jesus taking all these people, his disciples with him, on a missions trip. Hey, we're going to go around to these different villages, and they came with Jesus. It says that Jesus was sharing the good news about the kingdom. He was teaching, and guess where the disciples were at? They were with Jesus. And I believe that Jesus was, as they were with Jesus, they were spending time getting to learn from Jesus and seeing what Jesus was doing. Now, look over, bounce over with, go, to be, go with me to Luke 9. In Luke chapter 9, verse 1, it says, When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure, cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Ha! Ah, we see over here, they go with Jesus. And Luke chapter 9 now, we see Jesus sending the disciples out on their own. And Jesus staying behind. Now, go over to John chapter 10. Look at John chapter 10. We see again, Jesus now sends out the 72. He sent out 12. Now he sent out the 72. And he says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to, to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. See, we see that there was a process that Jesus was developing skills in his disciples. It didn't happen overnight for them. It was a, just like anything else. It was a process in developing skills. Here's the key. The key for the disciples was this. They made themselves available. They made themselves available. And I think as we look at us as a family, as a church family, as a coastal life family, as we encounter Jesus Christ every day in our lives, and as we are being equipped through the Word of God, equipped to be disciples of Christ, the question we have to ask ourselves, and I can't answer this for you, but I have to ask it to myself, am I making myself available to God? Am I putting myself in a place where I'm available for God to use and work in my life? And the end result is this. We are able to feed and care for others. We are able to feed and care for others. At the end of it all, we see Jesus sending his disciples out in Matthew 28, saying, go, make disciples, baptizing and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And you know what I love in, Matthew, in that verse is the word obey. Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Because I believe that that's where it starts. Obedience. Obedience. 
If we are willing to obey God's calling in our life, I've noticed in my own personal life, when I'm willing to obey God's calling in my life, that is when I experience growth. That is when I experience transformation in my life. When I'm willing to say, yeah, Jesus, I'm going to obey you. And Jesus is telling his disciples, teach them everything I have commanded you. Teach them to obey everything I've taught you. Now you're going to take, and you're going to take that and pass it on to other people and teach them how to obey that and live that out in their daily life. And that is what I believe Jesus did with his disciples. And guess what? Here we sit today, 2,000 years later, as a result of what Jesus started with 12 guys. Isn't that amazing? And we're seeing the gospel spread all over the world. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about church buildings. I'm talking about people's lives being transformed. And it starts with you and I. Simply being equipped disciples of Christ to live out our faith right where God has us today. Wherever it might be. I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'm going to close in prayer. And what I want you to think about for a second is I want you to think about this profile of a disciple of Christ. Where are you at? In that circle, where are you at? Are you at a place in your life where, yeah, Christ is on the center of my life and I'm abiding in Christ? Maybe you're at the point where you're salt and light. Where are you at in that process of, of it being a disciple of Christ? Because God's heart for each and every one of us is that we be men and women equipped through His Word to be a disciple that will make disciples, that will make disciples, that will make disciples. And if maybe you're here, you're saying, you know what, Curtis, I, I, I'm nowhere on that list. I'm nowhere in that circle. And maybe today, just as we talked about at that encounter point with Peter, when he says, I recognize, Jesus, that you are the Holy One of God. You have the words of eternal life. And just as that blind man recognized Jesus as Lord, just as Zacchaeus recognized Jesus as Lord, maybe you're here today and say, you know what, Curtis, I now see and I do recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if that's you today, Today, Jesus is inviting you to follow him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus came and he died for those sins. Those sins that are separating you from God, a relationship from God. He has died for those sins, paid the penalty for those sins. And what he's inviting you to do today is to transfer your trust, your trust from trusting in yourself, trusting in your own good works, and transferring your trust to Jesus Christ and saying, Jesus, I recognize that I need you, that you are the Lord, that you are the Holy One, the Son of God, and that only through you can I have a relationship with the Creator of the universe. This morning, I want to invite you, if that's you, and you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, today, maybe God is calling you. Today, Jesus is standing at the door of your heart, knocking. And he wants to come into your life and take over your life. And just so you know, Jesus doesn't want a small piece of your life. He wants all of your life. He wants to have control of your life and to transform you from the inside out. And if that's what you want this morning, I want to invite you to pray this simple prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, today... I recognize that I have sinned. And Jesus, today I recognize that I need you in my life. Jesus, I believe with all my heart that you not only died for my sins, but that you were buried and that you rose again. And Jesus, today I ask you to come in my life. Change me. 